Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, Health Homes, which is an initiative that uh, the Office of Health Transformation is um, coordinating with mental health as one of the lead agencies. And um, Greg actually introduced the concept of the office to you a little bit earlier today, and um, I won't spend time reading to you the first slide, but we are absolutely in contact on a daily basis and we're really trying to work across what have been traditional silos in state government in order to move things forward quickly in a way that will be impactful for people who need services. Um, the initiatives that Greg went through um, are listed here. As you can see, there's quite a few of them. They're small bonds, but I've highlighted those in red that are applicable to what we're here to discuss today. Uh, creation of health homes for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, accelerating the use of health information technology and practices, and then encouraging patient-centered medical homes. And Dr. Eckler is going to speak to the PCMH model uh, following my remarks, and I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about how the two overlap but are not exactly the same thing. So um, about 18 months ago now, the feds issued a state Medicaid director letter related to Section 2703 of the Affordable Care Act, um, which authorizes states to create health homes for individuals with chronic conditions. And um, the feds will, um, upon approval um, of a state's uh, plan in this area, will grant enhanced reimbursement for states to put more of an emphasis with providers on care coordination. Um, I attended a session um, in Cleveland a, a little over a year ago now that was focused on integrated care, and they talked about the invention of the neck. Um, you know, creating the bridge between someone who has diseases of the mind and also diseases of the body. And this is, you know, an intuitive concept, but it's not one that the governance of healthcare has really um, focused on in a broad way in years past. Ohio is going to have two tracks of our health home work. Um, first of all, um, creating health homes for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, where the lead entity will be the community mental health center. That's where. Um, you know, a lot of folks come for services today and they may not be receiving the primary health care that they need. So in this first phase, the community mental health centers will be partnering with other providers who are serving that same person. We are in a later phase going to bring up health homes for individuals with other chronic conditions that are not necessarily mental illness related as a primary diagnosis. And that will be led by primary care, whether it's in a private office or an FQHC. And there will be ties to behavioral health, including mental health and addiction treatment services in that model as well. But the lead agency will be one of more physical health care. So our initial focus, as I said, is on individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, or SPMI. I apologize for the use of the acronym, but uh, there are a lot of folks who work in IT in the room, so acronyms are not uh, um, a new concept. Um, historically, and I, I've spent 17 years in state government, eight years of those have been in the state budget office. And I know that historically, when we talk about spending for Medicaid, we talk about how much is this department spending, and how much is this department and this department spending. And just, you know, kind of back of the envelope, um, services related to the Department of Mental Health and Medicaid run at about 4% of overall state Medicaid. Um, and so that's kind of how we looked at it over time. And the Job and Family Services Department, which is the single state Medicaid agency, does the spending for you know, most of the physical health care, and they kept their own data. But that's not really an effective strategy because it's not encouraging anyone, either at the state level or locally, to really try to work together. So we have a number of um, integration projects right now that are not necessarily related to Medicaid um, in the state of Ohio. I think there are five of them. And um, we're, we're learning from that, and we started talking about the concept of integration and how that should really be applied when we conduct data analysis at the state as well. And so um, along the, the lines of some hotspot data that Greg shared earlier, I like to use this slide. Of the 2.1 million or so folks enrolled in Ohio Medicaid, approximately 10% have severe or persistent mental illness. And they account for 26% of the spending when you look across all Medicaid spending, regardless of in which department the funds are appropriated. So not just looking at the slice that is the Department of Mental Health, but rather looking at the entire enterprise in the state of Ohio. So you can see that um, the, the amount spent is disproportionate with the number of consumers served. And again, this is another clue, as Greg said, that you can have um, uh, perhaps some inroads in progress, both in more clinically appropriate care that is comprehensive and also more effective spending. 
Uh, Greg shared this slide as well uh, related to hospital admissions, so I will not uh, pause on this one, but again, data informing that this is a very logical place where we should be focused. So our um, health home services that we have been working with the field to define for a number of months now will include um, these different areas. And you can see that in reviewing the list, none of them are directly related to a medical service. So we're not um, going to include directly in this, um, you know, an office-based visit for primary care, um, you know, that, that's coded separately today, or a dental visit. Those are also going to be paid as they are typically for Ohio Medicaid. But these new services are an attempt to bring providers together in support of the individual who's receiving services in, or need services in both primary care and uh, behavioral health care. And you can see that information technology is one of those services that is um, included in the concept overall of care coordination. As we think about enrolling individuals, we're not going to bring this up statewide um, with the flip of a switch, but rather we are looking for areas where providers maybe already have partnerships on the way that are very effective and are working well, and they can bring in this new Medicaid service, bill for that, and help continue the progress that's already underway. Or um, we can look at areas where there's promise of, of effective partnership and they want to get going, and this is exactly the catalyst that they needed. We are going to focus primarily for enrollment on those individuals who are already clients of community mental health because you know, you've got the base of folks right there who may not have the um, sorts of primary care in their lives that would be most effective. And our uh, the community psychiatric support treatment service is sort of our bread and butter case management service or CPST as it's known. And so folks who are receiving that kind of um, care management today will be sort of the initial wave of individuals on whom we'll be focusing. Um, again, in, in, but it's sort of provider-led because the provider has to decide that they want to offer these services before we can enroll the provider. After the health home concept is up and running, we would then encourage providers to expand and do outreach to other people who may be living in the community who are not today receiving um, either mental health services in a robust fashion or folks who have um, mental health needs but maybe have their chronic care um, uh, not addressed in a way that, that would be optimal. And so those might be people who aren't going to the mental health center often but they are going to the emergency department a lot. And so we will have data then to inform that that's a person to whom outreach would, might be very effective. And then also people who are receiving long-term care services. We have you know, folks who are receiving, let's say, nursing facility services who don't get out into the community, but they can see benefit from um, health home services, just like um, uh, folks who are living in their own permanent supportive housing. So um, the clinical partnership is critical. We want to make sure that there is actually a written partnership agreement between the community mental health center, which would be the lead agency, and then also a primary care partner or partners. And depending on the size of the area, depending on the um, number of individuals that the provider serves today, it might be a host of um, primary care folks or it might just be a single practice. It, it really is going to vary. Um, and then we also really want this approach to be one that is workable for the provider. So we have some, some sort of core parameters, but then we want the, the health home to really build the team that is most appropriate for those individuals who are being served. If it's a child serving agency, for example, your team uh, complement or your team um, membership might look a little bit different than it's, if it's someone who serves primarily adults with forensic needs and, and um, had a lot of interaction with criminal justice. So you might have a housing um, person as part-time on your team. You might have a pharmacist. You might have other sorts of providers that um, you, know, you interact with frequently that would make a lot of sense to draw in and help um, be explicit about your care coordination relationship and also you know, bring in a little bit of reimbursement to help um, you know, continue or uh, expand that relationship. We are currently um, uh, sharing a draft reimbursement methodology on which we've been working, taking into account what's been successful so far with other states. And we're asking um, the providers and others in the field to give us feedback on what would make the most sense from a reimbursement perspective. But what we want to do is really take into account the membership on the individual team, the level of licensure, the number of folks served, and then build a rate that is based on that specific circumstance rather than have a one-size-fits-all, you know, the, the case rate that's paid in 
Medina is going to be the exact same thing that's paid in Cincinnati. So um, we, we are trying to build in a degree of flexibility that oftentimes you don't see in um, reimbursement for Medicaid programs. The use of health information technology, as Judy mentioned earlier, is on the rise, but it is not where it needs to be. There are many providers who use exclusively paper. There are some that you know, email an Excel spreadsheet to another provider, and then they maybe put it into an access database or something, but it's not, it's, it's, it's homegrown. Others have a greater degree of sophistication. I know we have a number of community mental health center providers that are engaging with vendors and you know, beginning to purchase certified products and, and expand those and um, partner with others to kind of all go in together in order to leverage resources. Um, we want to recognize that health IT is important, but not everyone is on exactly the same speed to adopt based on revenue and, and resource challenges and you know just other factors. And so we recognize that this is going to be iterative. What we are saying is that we want to make sure folks are on a path toward implementing, but we're not requiring you to have a, you know, um, sort of uh, gold standard EMR on the day that you become a health hope provider. We hope that this offers actually some incentive, both financially and just in um, cooperation with others, to continue uh, as quickly as possible down the EHR road. We also are precluded federally as we're creating our health home reimbursement to just provide a bag of money up front for a provider to say, hey, make an investment that would be helpful to you. But rather, in order to sort of recognize that there are startup costs that need to be contemplated and addressed, we're um, going to be proposing a loaded administrative rate for the first 18 or 24 months. So that there's, there's a recognition that there are some upfront costs, but it's not um, sort of a, a um, uh, sum of money that can be spent sort of one time. It would be received over time. And then as health home is implemented and people are receiving the primary care that they have needed for quite some time, hopefully we will see a decrease in emergency department presentations and over a longer period of time, some of the costs related to chronic care management of conditions that hopefully will be avoided. And as we move into that phase where we're containing costs by not actually cutting services but making more of an investment in primary care, we want to shift our uh, health home rate to be reflective of outcomes. You know, are the are the data for the cohort of individuals served in your practice showing that they are actually presenting at the emergency department less than they were three years ago? Those sorts of metrics. So, um, and to the extent that outcomes are being achieved, we want to be able to reward with an incentive payment by sliding, you know, what had been initially administrative into more of an outcome. Uh, you know, sort of pay for performance sort of a model. This is not a risk-based arrangement, by the way. This is going to be a, a case rate on a monthly basis. So um, there's not risk borne by the, the um, health home for uh, if, if a person needs specialty services or something like that. Um, we also recognize that um, even if you have a loaded administrative rate, there are, you know, it's not enough to cover all of the costs that are associated with something like EHR adoption. And so um, one of the initiatives that we had just on a small scale this year was to set aside some federal block grant dollars and do some mini grants around um, adaptation of health information technology for in support of integrated health care. And so we awarded just within I think, the last probably six weeks some grants to a number of providers. I'll just read them quickly. I think there's six of them. Um, Southeast here in Columbus, Shawnee Mental Health Center down in Soyota County, Butler Behavioral Health Services in Butler County, uh, Coleman Professional Services in Portage County, Community Support Services up in Akron, and the Zeth Center in Toledo. So uh, we had, I think, about 30 applicants, and we were able to award six mini grants. Again, just you know, helps move folks a couple more miles down the road, and we think that we're able to add some value in that way. We have to have permission from the feds to move all of this forward. Um, we've actually engaged the assistance of a consultant who's worked in other states to successfully bring live their health home initiatives. And so we're actually taking advantage of some of the learnings of others who've gone before us with CMS. Um, but we have had very productive conversations to date, both with CMS and with SAMHSA, which is the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Authority. And um, we expect that we will have um, approval at, by the time that we need it. We did a statewide webinar on April 12th to sort of evangelize this concept with the field. And all of those materials
materials are available online if you'd like to go check them out. Um, and then we're doing now community specific forums in different areas around Ohio saying, okay, you've gotten the big, um, big picture message, let's dr drill down into details and hear from you about what it is you're doing and how this approach that we're suggesting either works or doesn't work so well so that we can then refine our approach before we finally have federal approval. It is critical that we have providers who want to uh, participate in this because if we don't have providers participating, we will not have a health home. And I think generally the, the response has been pretty positive, but um, you know there's a lot of education and outreach that's underway right now, so we're working in earnest on that. We expect that we're going to be implementing in some areas of the state beginning this fall, and um, we will you know bring up as many areas as are ready. Again, this is a provider-led initiative, and so we're, we're really at the point where we're doing a lot of very intensive provider engagement. And then we're going to bring on areas over time. So the feds actually have a, um, a geographic specific time frame. So if you bring up an area as health home, they will provide the enhanced reimbursement for 24 months. So if we bring up health home in Cuyahoga County um, in October and then Mahoning County in January, Mahoning County's clock starts in, um, in January for 24 months. So we will have sort of rolling implementations. Um, this is good because you know we have continued incentive dollars and it also helps the, the areas that come later um, learn from those who've gone before. And so we think that there's value there as well. Just a, a, a couple of clarifying terms here. You're going to hear in a few moments about patient-centered medical home. And um, when I put this presentation together, I was under the impression I was going second. So I thought, well, I could just uh, take the opportunity to clarify this. But um, patient-centered medical home is um, generally a, a primary care initiative that is focused on the entire practice, all comers to, um, you know, Tracy's uh, doctor's office. And it's really a, a practice-based approach. And um, it's focused on wellness, and it could be any person, whether you're covered by Aetna or Ohio Medicaid or Medicare or, uh, you know, just pick your payer. Health homes for chronic conditions for Medicaid is specific to the Medicaid population. So a, a, a um, let's say primary care doctor's office could be both a patient-centered medical home for its aggregate population and also a Medicaid health home for those enrolled in its Medicaid um, uh, list of, of patients. And so um, we are identifying those people who would be um, enrolled in health home. Right now it's those with severe persistent mental illness and it, it really focuses intensely on the integration between physical and behavioral health care. Um, so um, we're focusing on those sort of higher cost individuals whose outcomes over time have probably not been optimal. So there is a degree of overlap between the two circles, but depending on the provider's um, uh, level of Medicaid penetration in the practice, you know, that level of overlap would vary. So just a couple of resources, and you can see these in your packet. Um, we have a website with extensive materials, which is the first bullet. Um, if you're having a little trouble maybe sleeping some night, I might suggest the second bullet, because that's a lot more sort of bureaucratic detail. Um, and then, of course, the uh, State Medicaid Director's letter that sort of got this all started for, for uh, us here in Ohio is listed there as well.